Thank you very much for that introduction. And uh, it's a huge honour and privilege to be asked to come and speak to you today about palliative care, especially as I'm aware that I have colleagues working in palliative care here already as well. Um, it's important to say that obviously what we're doing in the UK is quite innovative um, and it's trying to think about how you can use some of this information um, in your practice and in your communities. Um, healthcare systems internationally are facing challenges of providing healthcare to an increasingly frail elderly population of patients. Um, and what we're finding really is part of this challenge is the, is the rapid increase in these numbers of frailty. So age-attuned palliative care is something that we've been considering for a little while and it's a concept that's been pulled together by Caroline Nicholson who was the lead for this project. She's a clinical academic at King's um, and also our chief executive officer at St Christopher's, Heather Richardson. Um, and basically, when asked to deliver a talk to you about palliative care, and living and dying in old age, it really got me thinking um, about how historically hospices, particularly in the UK, have innovated care to make changes to respond um, and develop new approaches in response to these challenges. Um, those of you that have any background in palliative care may have heard of Dame Cicely Saunders, who was the founder of St Christopher's. Um, and some 60 years ago, she noted that the experience of people um, dying needed um, to be improved um, and that there was a lot of secrecy and misunderstanding and missed opportunity in providing support for people. Uh, and starting hosp modern hospice care was the catalyst to make these changes. Um, Michael Mandelbaum um, is a professor, an American professor, um, and basically he suggests that looking to the past and using historical analogies can be helpful in kind of giving us a map and a vision to move forwards. And I say this as Dame Cicely identified death and dying 60 years ago as needing input and change. And what we're seeing now with frailty is a similar issue um, that we need to address. And because of our particular expertise in palliative care, we're well placed to consider these challenges. Recently, at St Christopher's, we hosted an event on living and dying in, in old age. And we started the day off with stories from three individuals that were all expert by experience. So most of these people had had a parent or, a, or another relative with dementia or frailty for whom they provided care to. And their stories really depicted an experience that was quite uncomfortable to hear for all of us that were there, similar to cancer patients 50 and 60 years ago um, that late or no diagnosis sometimes, um, late referral to services, um, similar shortcomings that we saw um, previously and particularly the suffering is often unrecognised in people that are frail and that are very elderly um, and we needed to do something about this because what we were seeing was care that was patchy and uncoordinated uh, and doesn't really account for the incremental deterioration that people experience. So when people are frail and elderly, they do deteriorate very slowly and don't really get to back up to baseline. Um, so we need to ad address this problem in a different way. So I'm here to talk to you about age-attuned palliative care, which is a way of trying to bring into harmony what we know about aging, but also to transpose a bit of our knowledge of palliative care on top of that as well um, to try and make some changes and it's not looking at kind of the complex technicalities of care um, it's more thinking about the human component compassionate care and, and trying to make people still feel valued <coughs> and this does require a certain type of flexibility um, in the service that we that we're trying to provide certain resource and a certain compassion so like I say, I'm not professing that we have all the answers. This is a bit of work that is in progress. Um, but some of the innovations that we're working on at the moment will hopefully give you something to think about uh, and also some consideration for those of you that may be involved in service development or thinking about how services may need to change in the future to meet the needs of your population. Okay. So, I'll just move us on. Okay. 
there we go. So, a little bit about my clinical life. So, as per my introduction, thank you. Um, I work three days clinically um, at a hospice and I work two days for the Faculty of Nursing. Uh, this is my other home, St Christopher's. We're based in South East London. I thought it might be interesting for you to know a little bit about that. Um, considered one of the first modern hospices uh, in the UK, we cover a really wide area, geographic area. And what you can see here is London is very large, but we cover a significant proportion of South East London that encompasses five boroughs. And within those five boroughs, we serve a really distinct and ethnically diverse population of patients. Um, so that's a little bit about us. And what we do provide at St Christopher's, we provide inpatient palliative care. We have a 38 bedded unit that we're starting to have to use in a very different way due to the need for inpatient beds. Um, we offer majority of our care to the community, which is where I'm based, visiting people at home. That allows us to be more efficient, um, it's more cost effective, and I like it because you really see the reality of what's going on in people's lives. Because when people are admitted, you see how people present to you. When you're in someone's home, you really see the full picture of them, how they're managing and those around that are supporting them. We have also made some changes. We also have an outpatient team, so patients that are ambulant and able to get into us. Um, we invite them to have um, reviews in clinic, um, and that is a, a bit of a sea change, really, because we used to see patients that were very, very ill that couldn't get to us, and now we're seeing patients earlier to try and be proactive uh, and engage with them earlier, so we have a relationship and we have a rapport with them. Um, so traditionally, we've provided what we call specialist palliative care. So a lot of symptom control, a lot of psychosocial support. Um, and traditionally, that happened very late on in someone's illness. In the last 10 to 15 years, we're trying to see people much more early on their journey, often while they're still having treatment, because we can help them with that adjustment uh, to changes in their healthcare. Um, we also have a day centre there um, where people can come and get used to the environment and we try and open it up to the community because um, hospices have often been seen of a place of fear. People worry about being referred to us, causes a lot of anxiety for people. So we've really tried to break down those barriers and make it a community focus. So there people on the street can come in and have a meal and spend time. You don't have to be part of the hospice to try and engage the community so they're less, they're less concerned about um, coming to see us. Um, so yeah, and we work very closely with our colleagues, um, statutory colleagues like general practitioners and community nurses to try and make sure care is coordinated. But as I say, we've noticed recently there's a disparity um, in those accessing palliative care. What we were finding was that people with a cancer diagnosis were getting like a gold standard treatment. And actually those with dementia, frailty, heart failure were not getting that support, yet their needs were the same. And that's what started this conversation about how we need to change and adapt our services. So, I'd like to ask you a question about frailty. Is it relevant to you and your practice? Just have a moment to think about it, because I suspect it is. So, frailty is a especially problematic expression of population ageing, and it's characterised by the loss of reserves, really. And people become vulnerable um, to any shock to those reserves because they're physiologically decompensating, um, especially after a stressor event. So put simply, these frail patients, if they have a UTI, if they have uh, a sudden reduction in mobility, they are much more vulnerable and much more likely to access acute services. And we're trying to think about proactively preventing that if it's not going to actually make any significant change or improvement to them. And what you can see from this graphic here is a survival curve for the outcome of mortality for fit, mild frailty, moderate frailty and severe frailty. And what we can see is a significant downward trajectory um, for our patients and is associated with poor clinical outcomes, a higher likelihood of being institutionalised or needing care and a significant economic impact. And partly, uh, as money often drives changes in the UK, 
the need to try and prevent people being in acute hospital beds that are expensive versus having alternative care. So hopefully you're seeing some similarities with uh, potentially the population here. Um, and there is evidence um, that we're seeing now that frailty might be, might be modifiable. So although that curve is downward, if there's interventions we can put in place, we can potentially make things better for these patients uh, and potentially improve their quality of life. And that would be a really positive outcome for this patient group. So, put simply, you can see there, what is frailty? It's in a state of increased vulnerability, simply. Um, age and morbidity um, related decline in the body's physical and psychological reserves. And it can be really considered a long-term condition um, in its own right because it needs to be managed. And people are at risk of dramatic deterioration purely if they're frail. And I'm talking about our patients that are in their 80s, 90s, in their hundreds, that might not have an identifiable court, uh, condition, but if they are decompensating, if they're having reduced mobility, if they're having more admissions to hospital, we can consider them frail. We also have outcome measures that we use, like the elderly frailty index, which we can use to kind of monitor how people um, are responding as well. And Clegg has published extensively about what frailty is, um, and I'll let you have a look at that, but it involves multiple systems. People gradually lose their inbuilt reserves and in trigger to an event, so even a small event, a change to a medication, an infection, they can, they can severely deteriorate quickly. So the reason we're talking about uh, age attuned palliative care, this is, this is based upon a publication from Help the Hospices Commission, um, which is a body of experts in the United Kingdom that tries to look at how we need to direct our services, um, how we need to make changes, how we need to be sustainable because hospices in the United Kingdom are mainly charitably funded. So we need to respond to the needs of those donating to us. So we're, we're, we're regulated in a slightly different way. And this report that was written, which um, if any of you are interested, you can access online, really kind of set out an increasing need to expand end of life care in particular for some of these patients. So this was like the starting pistol um, for what we need to do. We were seeing that people were becoming increasingly complex as they were living longer and that over 65s will represent a quarter of the population by 2035, which is a huge, uh, a huge number. So we do need to think differently. Um, a lot of authors have found that access is in, not, there's no equity um, to hospice care. And indeed, the Centre for Policy and Ageing has identified the fact that societal change is significant. There's challenges as families are becoming smaller, families are becoming more fragmented due to technology, people are travelling more, there's people not around to care for families like they would have traditionally done. And also what we've seen um, in the UK, and I presume in a similar developed economy, we're having gone from high fertility, um, high mortality kind of um, society to low mortality, low, low fertility society. Um, and we're seeing a much larger living generation. And that obviously poses problems because then you have a group of patients that, a group of the population that are, are need care and, and are not necessarily paying into the system as well. So this report kind of did some modeling on future demand for care uh, and showed a significant shortfall. And in my research um, for looking at statistics for Singapore in preparation for this, um, indicated that the proportion of elderly residents in Singapore is increasing as well. And by, uh, by last year, 2018, um, the number was 13.7%. So a s relatively similar number of what we're seeing. Um, and also significantly improved life expectancy. So this is only probably likely to get more of, more of a challenge. Um, and there are challenges to um, accepting this. We often find general practitioners struggle um, with referring to palliative care services because they may have a relationship with the patient, they may have looked after them for a long time, and they struggle to then make that decision to say, actually, we can't help you anymore, you need to see 
the hospice or you need to see a palliative care team. So there's, there's evidence in the literature, it's a struggle for clinicians to, to make that change. Um, and also, just generally, societal attitudes to death and dying. There was a small um, survey conducted in Singapore, a thousand person survey from the Lien Foundation, excuse my pronunciation if that's not right, um, that found 77% of Singaporeans uh, would like to die at home, but only 27% of deaths do actually occur at home. So there's a greater chance of this happening um, if healthcare systems are geared towards meeting people's needs. So this is about the structure of what we're going to look at today. So the present is a changing landscape. Um, the present context of dying internationally, we need to think about similarities as we've discussed, the provocation, um, the challenges and the opportunities for the hospice movement, what can we do, what can we build on, uh, what expertise can we use to improve this. And the proposal really is to become age attuned uh, and to bring in harmony uh, with what we're looking at, people's wishes and preferences. Because we need to make changes as quickly as the world is changing for us. And in particular, my question from a lot of you working in hospitals is what can acute services take from the partnership working that we will discuss um, in terms of the services that you're, that you're offering? Okay. What we do know is that people with frailty and multiple long-term conditions, we'll call that multiple morbidity. So if you see MM, that's what we're talking about. It produces numerous healthcare challenges for patients, and in particular, patients with long-term conditions like dementia and heart failure. And the accumulation of these increases people's utilization of healthcare. So we'll see them more frequently in hospital. They'll have more complex treatment. They often have duplication um, and more fragmented care. And this is reflected uh, in a recent paper that was published in Singapore as well. So although we're talking about what's happening in the UK, exactly the same challenges are happening here. And all of this over-treatment that we see in this patient group can adversely affect outcomes and quality of life for them. Because what we find is often this group of patients do get significantly over-treated as well, which is not a good use of resource and not particularly a good use of someone's time. Our medical director at St Christopher's has a saying that I'd like to share with you that we should never waste a dying person's time. And I absolutely agree. <laughs> if you can't change, if you can't necessarily um, modify it, sometimes we can modify, sometimes we can't. And if we can't, we need to encourage people to live well. So this the little graphic to get you thinking about the current picture. In the 1900s in the UK, life expectancy was approximately 47 years, years old, which is pretty young. And the top causes of death, a lot of people died in childbirth due to infection, due to accidents. Um, and people were cared for in extended families, and there was very little disability before death. We move on to 2018, you can see our life expectancy has significantly gone up. Significantly gone up. Top causes of death now are dementia, heart failure, and cancer. And typical societal context are dispersed families. And there is often some length of disability before death. Can be months to years, can be longer. And what we're going to th the projection is from the work done at Edinburgh University is that as life expectancy increases, we're going to see more multiple morbidity and frailty, um, potentially more fragmented, more lone living. And we're trying to think about how maybe friends and neighbours can support people's care because actually healthcare services, particularly in the UK, can't, can't do it all. There's not enough provision. Um, and what we're looking at is potentially much more long-term frailty and a much longer time living um, with disability or impairment of health. And that obviously affects quality of life. So, we need to think about these changes. There's a little infographic there. Life expectancy in Singapore is significantly better than the UK as well. So maybe I need to come and live here. <laughs> so, the present is a change in experience of dying. 
So we're, we're after a notion of living well with a life-threatening illness, and this has a different meaning to 50 years ago, where people died of infectious conditions, we now have vaccinations, people expect to live a long time, people expect to go to hospital and be made better, and they expect then um, to return home. But that's not the case for everyone, unfortunately. And what we're seeing now is the concept of a social death, so these people that are frail and elderly and potentially living in the margins of society, they're not necessarily engaging with their communities as much as they used to. And people are, can, could be considered um, to be not dying as well as they could do. I don't know if any of you have come across the book Being Mortal. Has anyone read that? No? It's a really interesting book um, from a surgeon in America. And he looks at the veneration of elders is gone, but not because it's been replaced with the veneration of youth, but it's been replaced by the veneration of independence and being productive. And what we're seeing is in our elderly communities, they feel like they're burdening people and they're not wanting to engage. There's a separation between society. Um, this particular group of people living in the margins was the focus for Caroline, who was the, the lead author um, of this publication, um, dissertation, her doctoral thesis on the experience of living and dying with frailty. And many old people talk about losing confidence and trust, not only physically because they can't do what they wanted to do, but also in the wider world. They don't feel as important, they don't feel they have the links to their communities. People become socially isolated and this obviously um, leads to a decline in your physical and mental health. Uncertainty and illness is also uh, an issue um, that people struggle to deal with and I am finding as well more and more people that are not necessarily expecting to die even though they are very elderly and we need to challenge some of those assumptions as well. I do come across many hundred year olds that have never thought about dying and I find that fascinating because none of us are immortal. Um, but we've gone from a system, particularly in the UK, where we have a pretty good health service um, that people now use for everything, whereas before communities would care for their, their elderly, and we've kind of forgotten how to do, how to care for them. And we need to kind of re-engage with that if we're gonna change things. That's good, I can see a few of you nodding, so I think there's, a, there's similarities here. There's also evidence to see um, that there's a greater incident in hospital deaths if people have non-trained carers around them as well because people tend to panic and send people to hospital and it may ne not necessarily be the right place to be. So trying to engage with education of those as well. And I was teaching yesterday and I understand advanced care planning is quite ingrained now in your practice, which was really good to hear. We're doing a lot of work in that in hospitals in the UK to try and make sure that is happening as well. And the need is important um, to reduce unnecessary admissions and also to reduce unsolicited medical interventions that are going to be futile for people. So here's a little graphic uh, again, the present a necessary change in service response. There's an increasing call to do something different with a limited amount of resource. And what, we, what we've decided really is we need to offer older people honesty and choices about the decisions they're making um, and understand the importance of dying in later old age has a different meaning to dying if you're younger as well. Um, a shift from funding really is what we're seeing in the United Kingdom, More, a much bigger thrust for community-based services, like I've said, because they're cheaper and you can reach more people. If you have someone in an inpatient bed, it's very intensive in terms of the service you have to provide. And we need to think differently beyond prognosis to need to uncertain clinical trajectories. I'm sorry this graphic is a little bit small up here, but in our cancer patients we have a period of relative stability and then a sudden decline. With organ failure you have dips and it gets worse, but as I've said with frailty it progressively deteriorates. So people become more dependent over time and the amount of care we need to give them increases. Um, our medical director at the bottom there as well is Rob George and our purpose must be to help the person conclude life well rather than to watch them meet death badly. Very pragmatic. And our provocation is that hospices, we are pretty good at thinking differently because we don't have the financial constraints of, of, our, of the NHS that we have, our health service. And there's lots of evidence from surveys that 
as we have made changes, we've tried to reduce the length of stay in hospices and that's really made a big difference to what we can do for people. So traditionally, I'm unsure here what length of stay is like, but a length of stay in a hospice in the UK is about one to two weeks now, whereas people used to go to a hospice for months on end. So it's a short intervention to get on top of symptoms or if someone is acutely dying and they need that input. So it means that we can reach a lot more people. But what we do see is that there is still marginalised groups that don't have access to hospice care, in particular those from ethnic minorities and those with dementia. So it's disproportionate and we're trying to address that. One of the ways we've gone about that is to look at um, developing new services and something that I was involved with um, in starting up was a new service in the community where I work. And this was called the Bromley Care Coordination Centre. So this was a small pilot study we did, um, working with commissioners, so they're people that, that buy services, um, to have a nurse-led service that would be proactive in seeing patients um, that were not typically your cancer group, that had heart failure, that had dementia, those with non-malignancy, the group we weren't meeting. And it's been a huge success, really. Um, we set up a service initially with just a very small group of nurses, just two clinical nurse specialists um, for a year. And then the service got expanded and we now have a service um, that covers the whole of Bromley. And it's also being modelled in other areas. And what we found is it enables older people to live longer at home, that they have advanced care planning completed. Um, it helps to have those proactive discussions sooner instead of hitting a crisis point so that people know what to expect and families and carers are not necessarily sending people to hospital. Um, there's better communication with general practitioners, so when we see them, we send them a report. So it's all, it's all a bit more joined up. And you can see the activity numbers there. As of 2018, daily caseload was about 303 patients for this one particular borough and rising. And we managed to increase the home death rate from 23% up to 67% just by having proactive conversations and also responding in times of crisis. And that's a significant number that we're rightly very proud of. And it's something to consider if you are expanding community services here. It doesn't have to be all nurse led. We've actually started to use healthcare assistance. And we'll talk about a concept on the next couple of slides about just being with people and watching and waiting alongside them so we can then respond as we need to. So the model of care, just briefly, um, all of our referrals come to a single point of contact, whether it's um, for cancer or not, and we triage them. Um, we do an initial assessment and then we rate them depending upon uh, their urgency. We do have a rapid response arm that's still part of the hospice. So if, some, if we get a referral and it's clear someone is imminently dying, we would go out and assess them and we would try and manage their care at home. Um, if not, um, then we would plan a visit to go and see them and especially if they have cognitive impairment, we would get information from the mental health team or also their, um, their GP and their family as well, trying to have a family member with them so we can understand their wishes and preferences. And if they lack mental capacity, we would try and have their advocate there or their, uh, their power of attorney. So there's a little slide about the criteria that we have. So anyone with a high elderly frailty index, um, those of increasing uncertainty, those that are deteriorating, um, and long-term comorbidities, you can read there for yourselves. But often what we see is that those with a precarious social network, those carers that are really burdened for looking after people for a long time, are the ones that we really need to support. And we know that prognosticating is very difficult for this patient group. It can be very hard to know. But what we look for is if people have had three or more acute admissions to hospital in the last 12 months is often a good sign that, they're, that they are deteriorating. Um, and also sort of how frequently they're accessing um, other primary care services. As you can see from the next slide, this kind of outlines the age categories of our patients. So we have quite significant numbers of older people, mainly 85 years or older and we had 12 patients on the caseload, over 100 plus. Um, so you can see the, uh, the mean and the median is pretty significant.
and the ratio of cancer versus non-cancer patients remains high. I say that because a lot of these patients that may be frail or elderly might have a stable cancer diagnosis, so they might be treated for prostate cancer or breast cancer, so it's not necessarily their primary concern, so they don't have specialist needs. So I didn't want to confuse you there, but there's a group of patients that, that might be stable. And a few of our admissions, were, uh, our assessments were urgent and we responded to keep people out. So reflecting on this, we realised that key working is really important and this concept of watchful waiting, so not necessarily being there all the time, giving people the information that they can contact us if they feel there's a change, if there's a trigger, so then we can come and visit because that uses less resource and we're also not saturating people with visits that they don't need or contacts that are not useful to them. So there's that much greater reliance on families and patients letting us know, which can sometimes feel a bit uncomfortable for us as health professionals if we're used to having regular contacts with people. And it's also highlighted the need for crisis services. So we've had to expand our on-call service because if you have more patients on your caseload uh, for the hospice, if you, we've got an extra 303 people now that might call us uh, and need an urgent response. So we've had to expand that. Um, and rethinking complexity. Um, you probably haven't come across the, the term OAK. There's a collaborative with uh, King's College for, uh, uh, and the Sicily Saunders Institute about assessment tools in palliative care uh, and thinking differently in order to use them for our, our patient population. Uh, and if you want to have a Google of that, it might be interesting for you because it helps us then capture what changes we are making and then that helps us then fight our corner for improving the money we get and developing services further. You need evidence to do that and uh, the more evidence we have the stronger our argument. Um, again other findings from this pilot it's been important to make trusting ongoing relationships with patients. Often patients can feel let down by certain services and us being there regularly and understanding we will and can respond in a crisis is really important. Um, two thirds um, of, our, of, the, of any working week is considered out of hours and that's often when problems happen. It's always a Friday night, it's always in the middle of the night when someone feels distressed and actually often just having a number to call is reassurance enough to hold a lot of these problems. It doesn't often warrant a contact from a clinician but it's just de-escalating the stress people have and talking it through. Um, and also recognising there's a gap in rehabilitation. Um, for these patients. I'll just skip through that one. So Caroline's research, she came across um, several patients. She interviewed 17 of them um, as part of her doctoral thesis and I've captured a little bit about what, what she captured in her, um, in her, in her uh, research because I think it's quite powerful. Um, this is Eli. He is an Indian national that came to the UK when he was uh, 54 years old. Um, and he came in 1960. And as part of the interview, he was 101 when he was interviewed, um, and he was met five times during the study. And it was really important to get patients' perspective on what it was like to live with frailty and not a cancer diagnosis and the problems that this created. And in the first interview, we can see that Eli said that people get tired, but for me, I don't, I don't end, I don't just retire. Old people here in England have done one job and they retire. And he was making a point that he is retired, but he's not retired. Um, and he wanted us to follow his language. Um, he did, can't recognise people because his hearing's not so good, his sight was impaired, but his mind was working constantly. Uh, his mind was working, but his body wasn't, wasn't playing the game as well. After six months' data collection, Eli doc documented that he went to see a doctor, they couldn't really help him, they just said he should go home. He knows hospitals are there to support him, but actually, what is he supposed to do? Where am I supposed to go if I don't feel well, but my doctor's saying they can't do anything for me? And this experience was a thread that we saw throughout his, throughout his uh, contact. And this got us thinking, in particular Caroline, about a framework drawing on current theory and practice to how we can, how we can change this, how can we make things better for people like Eli. And one aspect of that is asking people about what matters to them. What makes people feel connected? What are the important relationships people have? And what's, what's conducive to people living well? 
And what people said to us was maintaining continuity, maintaining a sense of self, of individuality, um, the role of family, um, social networks and community. And one patient said, the glue that holds my life together is not there anymore. My family have moved abroad. I don't know my neighbours. I'm just on my own. And old age is not a disease, but we will all die. So this is going to be a problem for all of us if we don't sort it out as well. And it's about keeping the whole in mind as well. So living and dying between independence and dependence. And there's a dual focus here. How can we respond to complexity and difficulty by making it simple? It's not as simple as that. We need to rebalance our thinking. We need to share responsibility. We need to create networks and we need to empower others. And a lot of this is about empowering our patients as well. And we call this a multi-level approach. So dip working differently with older people as part of a different clinical response, working in partnership to improve services and wider societal change. So this diagram here um, is also in, you can access this as a PDF if you're interested in looking at this more and there are a few leaflets around. And we've come up with the concept of balancing continuity and adaptation to loss. And what we do know is it's sometimes easier to do for people than to actually help them to do it. And we're very guilty of that in hospitals. It's easier to wash someone than assist them to wash. Um, and what we want to do is create independence. What we found is, in particular, one strand of the adaptation is community participation. And in hospices, we've always had a very good link to voluntary sector, and we've tried to use that to think differently now. One aspect of this that we've developed is something called compassionate neighbours. So we're training people in their community to, to support people in their communities. And this is provided free of charge. We provide training to the, peop the volunteers that want to participate. And then they can visit, to uh, have a cup of tea with people, offer friendship, companionship, um, understand what's important to people and help them connect, you know, do things with people that they want to do. And another strand of this is helping people navigate services. There's an awful lot of services that exist, but often if you're elderly, people don't tend to use technology as much. They can't find or access things in quite the same way. So we've got charity groups in the United Kingdom that we call Care Navigators, which is quite a grand title, but to help people work out what services would be beneficial to them. And we've tried to pull them into this umbrella as well. So it's one place for people to get support. The inner circle of that wheel is about optimising clinical response and what we've said about watchful waiting. Proactive, purposeful intention doesn't need to be a nurse, it can be a health care assistant. Engaging with people, understanding when there's an incremental change and that can be as simple as physical function. They're needing more care. Enabling people um, to live well and have rehab. Um, parallel planning, which we'll come, come to and also understanding the impact of multimorbidity and being proactive in planning for it. I'm not sure if you've come across the term parallel planning before, but it's an approach that we use a lot in paediatric palliative care, um, a process really where there's a number of possible outcomes um, and it's discussing that openly with the patient and family and acknowledging that there might be uncertainty and we're kind of hoping for the best, but planning for the worst, uh, wearing a belt and braces, whatever you can do to make sure that you're, you're uh, encompassing any potential risk um, for people and about having honest and open conversations um, and identifying the benefits and burdens of treatment. I see a lot of patients that are on medication that modifies their risk of illness over 10 years. If you're 100, you probably don't need it, so you might be having unnecessary interventions. So. And thinking how upstream and how can we share this? So what we found from the literature is that we need to systematically and comprehensively assess people with multimorbidity. Um, we need to look for patterns so we can have intervention. And there's some results from this paper, if you want to have a look, about the need for specific geriatric assessment tools. You can't just use standard tools for this patient group. They are different and their needs are different. So it's an interesting paper if you have time to have a little look at. Um, but it does reflect that the work we've done with the Bromley coordination team is, is following the data. 
Back to what, St Christopher's, um, again what we're doing here, we have started a concept called rehabilitative palliative care and it's a key feature in optimising clinical response for patients, um, trying to give people goals and often we don't think of patients, this elderly, of having goals. Their goal might be uh, that they still want to maintain their ability to use the toilet. But actually, often what happens is they're given equipment, they're given in a commode, and then two people help them get on the commode. What we're not thinking about is, is there therapy that could enable them to still do it independently for as long as possible? It's a different focus. Um, and we're training volunteers to work with people to motivate them to do programs. So again, there's less cost implication, but it can be something that can be rolled out. So they have, they're seen by a therapist and then a volunteer monitors the, the plan with them as well. But we're not very good at setting goals um, for our elderly patients. And it's often due to the language we use. We often say, you know, what's the matter? But we need to say what matters to you, you know, what's important to you. What are your hopes? You can still have hopes when you're very elderly. We need to change the language and then you get a different response. If you ask someone how they're feeling, they'll generally say awful. But if you can reframe the question, ask them what an immediate priority is, they'll generally tell you something practical. So always consider your language as well. Often we say, how bad is the pain? For example, when we could say, what's the pain stopping you from doing? And actually that's a much more enabling question to get people to do things. Um, and it directs practice in a manner that values what's important to the patient. And again, we've talked about this as well, but improving services and systems of care is the, is the inner ring of that, of that document as well. So the key service missing that we often see is mental health services. So we're working on integration with that, especially for our dementia patients, because it does seem to be out on the side. So we're trying to have meetings with um, geriatricians. We're, work we're having things called integrated care networks where we're having geriatricians meeting with general practitioners to meet the needs of the, of the patients. So we're trying to pull everyone together. One strand of this, I don't know if you've come across Project ECHO before. It's been rolled out. It's an American concept of using a Skype-based system to set um, priorities in education. Um, and it stands for Extension of Community Healthcare Outcomes. So particularly like community health groups and nursing homes struggle to actually engage and have training. So we set them up with a topic and then a specialist delivers some training. We give them the, uh, an agenda beforehand so they can ask questions and it's been really successful. We've, we've met, um, we've accessed about a thousand people since it started already through this that have had an understanding of that and that helps us build capacity in what we're doing. And we're also using charitable trusts as well to disseminate what we're doing locally um, to try and extend the reach because we see that it's important uh, and we need a framework for other people to follow. Um, lastly um, is the societal response. So we're trying to make changes um, to people's perceptions of, of being elderly and frail. Um, a good part of this that we've come across is a concept called Coach for Care which is peer-led coaching. So a lot of the feedback we had was that often carers, if they are available, want to care for their relatives, but they've lost the skills. And we've said people don't do it. People rely on professionals, but some, some groups of patients, uh, particular dementia patients where new people cause confusion and often loved ones want to continue caring for them, um, they want some support. So we're trying to marry up people that have cared for people, give them some training so they can support people that are new to caring peer support and that's been really well evaluated um, from those people that have experienced it. So back to Eli, one thing um, that was discussed uh, with Eli was the language that was used for him and the fact that he felt that he was marginalised and when the interview was recorded one thing that Caroline asked him um, at the end when they were concluding um, was do you want to hear the recording of, of, what, of your interview, of what we've captured about you? And he said he wanted to hear his voice. And I think that's a really powerful message that this is a group of patients that are not necessarily being heard, that we're not really accessing their, their true thoughts and feelings about the systems that are in place. And I hope that you'll feel empowered to think about how we can help them in the future. And lastly, yeah, what we need to move away is the fact that we've medically resisting the biology of ageing. We can't, we need to think differently and we need to uh, have different services. 
in place for that. So I'll leave you there. I'd just like you to think, if you have any questions, I would love to take them, whether it's related to this or any, any questions you may have about palliative care in the UK. Um, I wonder if the model that we've discussed has any aspects that might be useful to you in Singapore, um, whether there is engagement with older people and frailty, whether there, there is voluntary services going on. I'm, I, don't, I don't understand the context here, but what would be helpful? Um, and who else might need to be involved? Because often us nurses on the ground, we have good ideas, but we can't elevate them because we're not, we're not in charge of the services. So thinking about how we can evidence that need. But, uh, thank you very much.